now, they, as you just have seen, arrived a little bit later than the one o'clock starting time, and that's because they have responsibilities before the one o'clock. And I want to let you know that at two o'clock promptly, they will be leaving, or maybe even a minute or two before that, because they have other classes that they have to go back to. So it reflects not at all upon our lecturer, <laughs> lecturers uh, this afternoon, but it's because they are fulfilling all of their responsibilities. Once again, welcome, everyone. It is my uh, honor to introduce the person who will introduce our lecturers today. Uh, she is the director of the Department of Education, Lifelong Learning, and International Education. Uh, my honor to bring to the microphone Carol Hildegard. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to College of Marin. As Dave mentioned, I'm Carol Hildebrand, Director of Community Education, Lifelong Learning, and International Education here at the college. We are thrilled to have this most intergenerational of events here at the final uh, event in our Spring Authors Series. So welcome again to College of Marin. And before I introduce our featured author, George Omi, I'd like to express our gratitude for the generous and ongoing contribution to this event by the Hattie Fund. It's an anonymous donation to College of Marin, and its funds are being used to support these events each spring. I'd like to thank Both Passage for hand-selecting such engaging authors for us and for being such a great partner in really trying to put together a diverse group of authors each spring to meet the interests and uh, needs of our community. And of course, I'd like to thank the library and Dave Patterson in particular for uh, coordinating so closely with Book Passage, hosting us here in the library, and in this case, also reaching out to Kent Middle School. We're so happy to have you here at College of Marin. So the Hattie funds that were given to College of Marin for this event were designated specifically for use by the student organization ESCOM, or Emeritus Students College of Marin. And that organization, uh, is, uh, that Dick is very much involved with as well through the curriculum committee, uh, exists to serve the needs of the older adult population in Marin County. Uh, it's dedicated to the principles of quality of life, lifelong learning, and personal growth. ESCOM and community education partner very closely together to organize events such as this, to include in our schedule that you all may receive in the mail or that we have around here on campus and in the table in the back. Many classes in here are discounted with advisement from the ESCOM curriculum committee. Uh, we also have many other classes that are available for our community. We invite you to take a peek at this schedule in the back and also, if you're interested in joining ESCOM, there's more uh, information available on the back table as well. I invite you on your way out to take a look and learn more about ESCOM. So, uh, as I mentioned, com Community Education is a co-sponsor of this event today, and we in Community Education are thrilled to have such an event like this. It gives us an opportunity to reach some of you who I recognize as our regular students, as well as some of you who may be new to College of Marin and to community education. As a note, we have about 450 classes that we offer each year. We serve about 4,000 students each year through about 7,000 enrollments. Our classes range from history to career development, physical fitness. Uh, we serve international students learning English in an intensive English format. We have just a wide array of classes, and we hope you'll take a moment to learn about community education and the other offerings at College of Marin. One featured class that I wanted to mention to this group in particular is we have a shorter form class coming up that's still available in our spring term, and it is going to be a lecture recital on the composer Franz Liszt. It's on Saturday, May 12th a two-hour class. It's taught by an, a professional opera singer with live performance by a concert pianist. And we think it's going to be a really interesting class, a little different than what you may assume Community Ed might offer. We invite you to still sign up for that class if you're interested and to consider and keep an eye out for the summer schedule for our summer term that's going to come to your mailboxes very soon. 
So this is spring. You may have seen this. Summer's going to be yellow, so keep an eye for that. And that will have a whole batch of new classes. Those classes will begin in uh, early mid-June. So I'd now like to warmly welcome our featured author today. Today is an exciting difference in the format for these events. Uh, he will be in conversation with his grandson, Garrett Omi. Uh, and George Omi is our featured author. He's going to be reading from and speaking about his book, American Yellow, today. In American Yellow, readers follow the Omi family as they make their way through World War II, from San Francisco to an Arkansas internment camp, and back again. George Omi lives in Mill Valley, California, he has won awards for his writing, which he only took up after retiring from a successful career as a landscape architect. So please join me in welcoming George Olney today. Consequences. 
My father took extreme umbrage at the word Jap and was unafraid of his adversaries. He once threw a large teenage kid to the floor of a garage when the kid called me a Jap. The word seemed to be everywhere then, in newspapers, the radio, and in movie theaters. Especially after American mercenaries flew the British aircraft, the Flying Tiger, against the Japanese Zero. Um, there was no end to this turmoil. Sometimes I wish I could trade in our chopsticks for silverware and have roast beef, potatoes, and gravy for dinner instead of broiled fish, pickled vegetables, and rice. Nevertheless, I love my family. During moments of conflict and loneliness, they gave me comfort, cared for me when I was sick with fever. They were always by my side, always together. I felt protected. My favorite uncle and aunt, Roxanne and Obasan, who were childless until a month before the war began, treated my sister and I as if we were their own. They would often shower us with love and toys and gifts. We never felt neglected. And Papa, so proud with a son, would often take me to bars where I didn't belong. And he would drink and sing with my uncle and friends and would only stop singing and drinking to tell their stories, both good and bad, some not for, meant for children. But no matter that I heard them all, they told them like I hadn't at all. It was a wonderful life then, no matter how little we had, until we had to give up everything we owned, including our rights as citizens. Shikata Kanai, Papa said, upon the notice of relocation of, pers re relocation of persons of Japanese ancestry. No can help. No can change. No matter how long I'm living here, we all the same. And now I would like to read from American Yellow. The miscarriage of their second child had taken such a toll on Oasan, my aunt, that the doctor advised her against trying for any more. Roxan, my uncle, in a fit of pique, peak, went out and bought a dog tan terrier with short hair. In short time, he and Obasan grew to love their dog. Obasan called her Poochie. Poochie was more human than dog. She quickly learned to sit, shake hands, bow, stand, speak, stay, and fetch. She even learned to pray, an unusual act for a dog, particularly since my uncle and aunt were not churchgoers. <laughs> Oyenori said, pray. Roksan would say, and Fuji would sink to the floor, cross her front paws, and lower her head. Fuji <laughs> must be Japanese, he would say to Papa in Japanese. How else can you explain the way she relishes Japanese pickles? <laughs> and Papa would reply, So, Fuji wa Fushibija, Fuji is remarkable. Whenever we went to see Roksan and Obasan, Fuji would sit quietly while Roksan scratched her back. And whenever he left the table to go to the icebox, she would follow him, wagging her tail. How would you like something to whet your appetite? Roksan would ask her in Japanese, unscrewing the lid of a takuan jar. And an unmistakable odor would settle into the kitchen. <laughs> P.U., I would say, turning my head. Roksan would chuckle and fish a radish pickle out of the jar. Anata Obasan would giggle from the sink. You mustn't use your fingers. Roksan would laugh, slice the pickle radish into bite-sized slices and offer a slice to Poochie. When she would only sniff at it and open her mouth to take it from his hand, Roksan would ask her in Japanese, Have you forgotten Poochie? And she would remember, sinking to the floor, she would cross her paw and lower her head. Good girl, Roksan would say stroking her head. Then he would place the food near her snout and let her take it gently between her teeth. Pucci was sensitive as well. She understood Roxanne's voice inflections, and Roxanne would say quietly, get in the box. She would know it was time to bed down. Fetching her blanket, she would crawl into her crate. <coughs> Roxanne teased her, telling her in a harsh voice, Pucci, fetch your blanket and get in the box. She knew he was only teasing. Growling softly, she would wag her tail and wait to hear his reassuring voice. <laughs> when Obasan learned she was pregnant, she was overjoyed, 
this time I will be very careful, she said in Japanese. I will do exactly what the doctor says. And she grew large with the child. Roksan would tease Pucci. What are we going to do with you after the baby is born? He would ask her, holding up a morsel of her favorite pickled radish. Pucci would wag her tail and circle around him. Pucci will have a baby brother, Obasan would say. And Roksan would laugh, wait for Pucci to pray, and then let her take the takman from his hand. When Roksan, a happy father, came into the cleaners with a box of blue banded cigars, what did you name him? Papa asked, accepting several cigars. Takashi, after his grandfather. How is Asaya? Mama asked in her high voice. She's fine, Roksan said. The doctor said that she should be home by this weekend. Can I come over and help? Mama said. No, you know how she is. If you came over, she would worry more about you than the baby. Mama nodded. Papa laughed and blew smoke in the air. Everyone seemed to be happy. Christmas was not far off, and I wondered what sort of presents Shi Chan and I would receive. But two weeks later, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and whatever comfort we enjoyed was lost. Suddenly, our lives was turned topsy-turvy. I was going to be 11 years old in eight days. And though birthday celebrations were never big in our family, I didn't receive presents from my uncles and grandparents in Stockton. That year, nor for that matter, did Shi Chan and I receive Christmas presents from Roksan and Obasan. Papa spoke to his friends daily. Only a few days after the bombing, important men in, in the Japanese community had been arrested. The minister of the Buddhist church, the editor of the Japanese newspaper, Japanese school teachers, and the leaders of the Hiroshima Kenjinkai, a prefectural organization. They'd be whisked away without notice. The FBI, the FBI didn't tell their wives anything, Papa said into the phone in Japanese. No one knows where they are. But after the initial arrests, nothing else happened. Nonetheless, Papa and his friends were worried. The government is afraid that we might do something bad, Papa told Roxanne on the phone. Sato-san, the barber, said that we have to get rid of anything that might look suspicious, anything Japanese. After that, Papa and Mama looked into closets and drawers and pulled out dolls, scrolls, vases, knives, and lacquered boxes, and anything made in Japan. Papa wrapped them in newspapers and placed them in cardboard boxes. The following night, Papa drove to the dump. We looked around and saw no one there. I helped take the boxes out of the car. With only the moonlight to see by, Papa dug a shallow grave and set the boxes inside. He closed his eyes and stood very still for several minutes. Then he covered the boxes with sand, and I prayed too. Then she seemed to remember. She went into the kitchen and returned with a carving knife. 
Is that what she means, she said, while I leave to the agent? No, ma'am, he said. Please put that away before someone gets hurt. The two men continued searching through clothes racks, under the bed, in the closets, dresser drawers, but couldn't find anything. Since Papa had buried in the sand or flushed down the toilet, whatever they could find that might have been incriminating. Sorry to have disturbed you, the tall agent said politely. After they left, Papa was relieved. I was afraid they would find something to arrest me for. Toward the end of January, with air raid drills, notices posted all over the city, and Papa's friend fleeing the city, it was difficult for Papa to sit still. Finally, he told Roxan on the phone in Japanese, there's too much happening around here. San Francisco is a military area. We should move to Stockton. Everyone is leaving. Papa had already spoken to Oji-san, my grandfather, in Stockton, and asked him if he would take us in. Of course, Oji-san said. We have plenty of room, rooms here at the hotel. Send whatever you have by railway express, and we will keep them here for you. Papa and Roxan tried to sell their cleaners but couldn't find any buyers. Finally, through the cleaning plant, they found people who were interested in taking over the business but not buying it. I understand your problem, Mr. Omi, the man said smoothly. With this war, who knows what will happen, but I can't pay you any money for the place. But I am willing to take over your business, if you like, for the sake of your customers. All right, Papa said at last. You come tomorrow, I show books everything. You take over next Saturday, we go Sunday. Roxan and Obasan did the same with their cleaners. When we went to see them, Obasan was folding clothes into a steamer trunk and Roxan was sorting furniture. If it's too large, send it by Railway Express, Papa told him in Japanese. What about Pucci? I said. Roxan looked sadly at her. Pucci, he said, shaking his head. No, she be in the way. Let me ask them, Papa said. My father-in-law has two dogs. No, no, they're doing too much already, Obasan said, sitting Takashi down on the blanket. Roksan said, and I can't trust you with Habujins, Caucasians. Pucci is Japanese. The other night someone threw tomatoes at our store from the back of a truck. Nearly broke the show window. I think they were high school boys. No, she won't like them either. After we left that night, Roksan decided what to do. He told us the following morning, when we met him to leave for Stockton. It usually takes 15 minutes from here to the dump, he said, but it took longer last night. I stopped twice. I wanted to turn back both times and then decided not to. And when I got there, the place was deserted. I didn't see another car or truck anywhere. He said he parked his truck near the dune where the street ended and felt the cold wind on his face when he, when he stepped out of his truck. He heard the surf and smelt the air. Seagulls circled and screamed overhead. He walked around, to the tr around the truck to the passenger side, opened the door and waited. He called to her, but she sat still. Setting his flashlight down, he called to her again. When she wouldn't move, he took a small package wrapped in wax paper out of his pocket. His fingers trembled while he unfolded the paper. Taking the taquan between his thumb and forefinger, he held it out to her. In Japanese, he said, be a good girl, she please. Suddenly, without warning, she leaped off the seat and onto the sandy pavement. Good girl, he said, stroking her neck. Again, he held the taquan near her mouth, but she wouldn't take it. Instead, she sunk down, crossed her paws, and lowered her head. You remember, Doksan said, and stroked her again. But when he held the taquan close to her nose, she took the radish between her teeth and let it fall. Pucci, he said, Miss D.I., it's your favorite food. Wiping away the sand, he offered it again, but she wouldn't take it. Then he said, take care of yourself, Pucci. Remember, Mama and I still love you. You have to stay here. You mustn't follow. He climbed into his truck and started the engine. As he drove off, he watched her through his rearview mirror and swore that she was crying. But she didn't follow, he said. She obeyed. Obey. Be a good dog and obey. But she was more than dog. She was Japanese. She ate takwan and could do most everything she was asked to do. 
She even learned to pray. She was different. No, she was not. Like us, she could only obey. And now I would like to introduce Garrett, my grandson. He's a Yonsei, a fourth generation millennial, Japanese American. He listens to rap music while spinning <laughs> upside down. He's a talented breakdancer with a degree in English literature. He's read my book filled with all the stories he's already read and already knows more kanji characters than I learned in Japanese school while I was growing up. Among his favorite authors is Haruki Murakami. He would like someday to read Japanese so he may read Murakami's book untranslated. My book has been a blessing in disguise. I never thought it would bring us together the way it has. Had I known this earlier, I may have published my book sooner. So Garrett, what do you say? I think that was the best introduction anyone's ever given me. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, you guys can hear me in the back, okay? Good. Thanks. So, I guess, God, we always sort of talked about, uh, since you just read the Pucci story, we could talk about it here. Um, as a transition, but Puji is sort of like a symbol of the Japanese predicament or internment. Um, I think that she really represented the ideology of Shigatakanai, uh, which is sort of more so like things are happening, um, you just have to deal with it, uh, whether with the cards you dealt with in life, and that's kind of the Japanese ideology behind that phrase, right? Yeah, um, more or less. I'm, I think that what I really appreciate about your book is uh, it really embodies sort of that whole ideology as a whole. Uh, you read the book and there isn't any sort of resentment, there isn't really any bias towards anything, um, you know, you, can, you really just read it straightforward and I think that you can totally tell it's nuanced into the way that you wrote the book. Um, and also, I think it sort of parallels sort of how you are a child during this time, and what happens to children is it just kind of happens, you know, things, you don't really know what's right or wrong. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I started writing very late in life. Um, as, as I said, I, I'm a retired landscape architect, and I, uh, in the, in I guess you'd call the last leg of my career, I, I um, began writing and, and, and they were memoirs and they were memories of my childhood. And uh, it was really hard at first uh, to put these uh, uh, stories uh, uh, down in print. Um, I, and I, I, I wasn't sure why I felt that way. It was almost like I felt ashamed of what had happened. I, you know, I, just, uh, I, I, I had a a very low esteem of myself, I guess, you know, as a kid. And I, I remember having problems even writing the word mama and papa. Um, but um, I began writing, um, I guess it was 1992. And I won a, uh, I, went to, I went to these writing classes uh, here at the College of Marin and, and Tom Santalala and I don't, I don't know, Betty Hobson, I, she, I don't, she was much older than me. I was, I think, then, but I don't know if she's still on uh, top. And Guy Biederman, but um, uh, when I won this contest, I, uh, it was a contest for uh, uh, writers over 60, uh, and the book, and the story got published in a book uh, called The Legacies, and so I thought, I thought writing was going to be a piece of cake. And I just, <laughs> so I, I, I began writing more, and, and, and the more became these manuscripts. I, I had book length, man, I picked up three book length manuscripts. And um, I, <clears throat> I tried very hard to find an agent and a publisher. And uh, this was in the 90s up to about the time I retired. 
and I just struck out every time, you know, I get these query letters, and it was so discouraging. <laughs> uh, some of the letters were anyway. So I should have stopped. I, I just, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, I, no, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say, talk, touching upon, like, uh, the, the fact that this is a memoir, uh, I recall doing an event with uh, Danny Shapiro, who's one of the, she's pretty well known for her memoirs, and I remember having a talk with her about memoir, and sort of how it is essentially what she called, uh, what's difficult about writing memoir is a, it's a dissection of the self. Um, you're really exposing the most vulnerable parts of you know your soul, um, but at the same time, it's also very liberating to essentially get that out. Um, and I was wondering, so what points did you sort of find? Did you find publishing this book as a liberation? Did you find it difficult? Did you find it both? You know. Well, you know, uh, after I gave up uh, uh, because I couldn't find anyone interested enough to take it on, uh, twelve years went by. You know, and I was cleaning up my garage and. And, uh, and I came upon these manuscripts, and I, and, and I, you know, I read, I read parts of what is now American Yellow, and I thought, hey, this isn't too bad. You know? so, <laughs> I, I decided that I would publish it, my, try to publish it myself, and I discovered that self-public publishing is, it, it was uh, not as expensive as it, it, it was, um, you know, back in, in, in uh, Early 2000. So um, to answer your question, yeah, um, <laughs> you know, my mind is getting jaded. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what your question. <laughs> Just about <laughs> your feelings on you know producing this book. Uh, was it a sort of liberation? You know, what kind of feelings did you have? You know, so you found the manuscripts and then you yeah, read it over. It, yeah, it, well, it wasn't exactly liberating. I, and I, um, uh, it, it was more satisfaction. It mm -hmm. was, you know, um, uh, and, I, and I was satisfied that uh, uh, with what I wrote and I thought it was good enough for for, for you and mm -hmm. your generation, you know, uh, to read because uh, it tells you who who you are, <laughs> uh, and so um, there, God, my, you know, I'm 87 years old. You know? <laughs> <laughs> to me, that was uh, one of the points, and um, eventually I was going to end up trying to publish it, but I think it's better that it actually ended up in your hands, since I wouldn't have been able to capture the tone since uh, coming from four generations. Uh, no, I've seen your yeah. writing, it's pretty good. You know? <laughs> but but <laughs> not modest, actually. Yeah. Um, it it would have been in good hands. Um, but I, you know, I'm glad that I, that, that I did go through that, and that I did have something and, uh, and you know, what was really satisfying was that I, I went to this book event we, at, at uh, uh, the Book Passage. They hosted my very first event. I didn't know anything about you know, books that way as an author. So uh, they hosted the event, and there was someone in the audience, a uh, friend, who said, you know, you ought to, in fact, I think it was Ken Sato's daughter, Marjorie, said, you ought to enter your book in a contest. There's this contest uh, by the Writer's Digest. And so I entered the contest, and they said, well, you know, they wouldn't know until the end of the year. That was 2016, and I, you know, I entered it in September. They said, you wouldn't know until December 31st uh, of who the winners are. And so that was New Year's Eve. And I, you know, um, happened to be by my computer <coughs> that evening. And lo and behold, I won first place. <laughs> yeah, I remember that day. <laughs> it was pretty exciting. Um, let me touch upon, uh, let's see, one of the 
things that I always like talking about for your book is the ending. Um, I don't think it's really a spoiler alert since we're all here now and we're back in the Bay Area, so you can assume what happens. But um, uh, what I wanted to say was um, I was curious as to why you chose the ending as you did for the uh, your family coming back to San Francisco. Uh, you ended on the line, they had finally realized their American dream. Uh, what exactly can you tell me about that American dream in that uh, last ending sentence? Uh, well, you know, my, you know, your great, your, this would be your great grandparents, um, and, and your great grandfather uh, had a pretty rough, you know, when they, when they first came to America. Um, it was just a totally different kind of world. Even for me, it was, but it was really hard for him. And uh, uh, I guess there's this thing between Japan and, uh, and, and, and uh, the Western world, I suppose, because Japan had been uh, uh, in isolation for all those years, uh, during the samurai years, and then, and then, they, and then uh, shortly after, you know, Commodore Perry uh, began to industrialize, and, then, and, and, and they began modernizing, and, and um, by 1905, when they fought Russia, they had become a world power. So uh, I guess there was a lot of fear uh, you know, about about Japan. And so a lot of ro a lot of unfair laws were passed against Japanese immigrants. Then and, and they couldn't own they they couldn't become citizens because of, of this uh, 1885 Chinese Exclusion Act, which which uh, denied citizenship, naturalized citizenship to Chinese. And that law then applied also to the Japanese. So they couldn't they become citizens. And then they couldn't, they couldn't buy property in California. They had, a, I don't remember exactly when that law was passed. I think it was around 1912 or 13. But then they couldn't, they, they, uh, uh, they couldn't own property. They couldn't own their house, you know, which is what they were. Right, right. Then, <clears throat> and then they passed in 1925, Immigration law, which prohibited Japanese from coming into to America, the, 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 the no Japanese quota the, the zero. So uh, it, you know, and, and and you look at what's happening today. You know, a lot of this kind of crazy stuff is happening today too. You know, in our world. Uh, but um, my father lived through all this, and so did my mother, and, and that whole generation, the first generation Japanese. So. When finally in 1952, I think it was the Walter McCarran Act was passed. Um, this was their, this was uh, the passage to naturalization, and my parents then then uh, uh, became naturalized citizens, and, and they were able to buy their first house. That was their American dream. Right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think what I also I. I see the American dream, and I, I acknowledge the what I also acknowledged for your ending was um, training as a docent for the Japanese American Museum. You sort of learn the Issei. Issei is first generation uh, Japanese. When they first immigrated over from uh, Japan, their goal was to serve the, uh, represent the emperor, and. Um, assimilate to American culture. But essentially, they were sojourners. They were going to go back home. And I liked what, you know, I, I don't think it was, in, maybe it was intentional, but what I really appreciated about the ending was it was sort of like you wrote the Nisei's version of sojourning because you were able to, the family was able to go to camp, assimilate, um, you know, represent as good citizens and make their way back home to San Francisco, full circle sojourn. Uh, essentially what the Nisei's, some did, some didn't uh, eventually, but that was a uh, first, Goal, I believe. Um, so I really appreciated that ending. Um, Gary, the yeah. students from camp have to go. Is there something your grandfather, Mr. Oni, could say to these youngsters? They were roughly your age. You're rough, they, you were roughly their age when this happened. What, what words of wisdom can you give them as they go back to school? I'm sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no. I have to think a little bit about that question. <laughs> um, 
you know, it, 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 because of what's happening today uh, in our world, um, you know, I could say that our my world was different, um, and it was a difficult uh, road to hoe, you know, when uh, uh, you're discriminated uh, and and you don't. You know, you don't you don't feel comfortable um, even sitting in a movie theater. You know, wondering what you know the people around you are thinking, especially if there's you know a, uh, the rhetoric, terrible rhetoric going on. So um, the uh, uh, what you have to do, and, and this is a, a Japanese. Japanese way I was taught, uh, uh, because I'm, 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 I'm not Japanese and I'm not American, I'm a Japanese American, okay? So uh, there's certain values that I received <coughs> from my parents and I've also learned that values as, in school as an American, so you know, it's a melding of, of, of both. And as a, in, in, in Japanese, uh, uh, it, it was always um, uh, stick it out and uh, give it the best you can. You know, um, my father was probably uh, too emotionally uh, disturbed by what was. And I, I could understand how, what his feelings were, but I didn't want to behave the way he was behaving. Uh, but I understood that uh, in order for me to succeed, there's no leaving America. I have to stick it out, and I have to prove that you know I was just as good as anybody else. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. I think it does. Thank you very much. We can continue as the, the students go back to Kent. Quietly. And then those go quietly. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for coming. I was going to say, yeah, this is a good transition. Um, questions from the audience? Let's see, I saw the first hand in the back. George, uh, you were talking about the generation. You say, you say how you were trying to, probably, I would call it assimilate. Whereas your parents' generation, you say they were angry and wanted to disturb things, made from their culture. There's a, a sociological law called Hansen's Law where every other generation uh, adopts their country, their uh, country's culture, and then the next generation. I'm a Sansei, so I'm after you. You're a Nisei, correct? Yeah. I'm Sansei, and so I was a little rebellious as a Sansei. So it'd be interesting to know what Garrett, as a Yonsei, whether he will go back to being more like you or more like your grandfather? So just picking up on the answers. Well, you know. Uh, that would be interesting. You either know about now or you know, follow up. Yeah, well, Garrett is pretty special. <laughs> um, and and um, it depends a lot on your, you know, your upbringing. Um, and uh, I think some Families, Nisei families, uh, are, are more integrated <coughs> uh, into the mainstream than, than others, which doesn't make it good. It's not good or bad. It's just that um, the, uh, the culture.
culture uh, uh, the values they understand uh, may not be the same and that's what I mean by the way you know uh, the way you're raised and so I think Garrett you know he's very interested in Japanese culture and uh, he's learning Japanese uh, on his own. He's been to Japan twice now in the last couple of months. And uh, he, he, really, he really loves Japan. Uh, so, but I, I, I think maybe I'll let Garrett uh, tell you more about himself. Because uh, uh, I'm just telling you what uh, I've observed and, you know. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh... It's pretty interesting. It wasn't until like recently in the last couple of months where I really started to like have this sort of cultural epiphany, I suppose. I think the most of my life actually I tried to block out my Japanese identity completely. Um, I was actually pretty, well not the most of my life, I'd say my adolescenthood, that's the best way I can say it. Uh, there were, you know, I grew up with all the stories of internment over the dinner table and I was able to, you know, grow up with that as the backbone of sort of my ideology and my identity. And so it was strange because when I got to my adolescent, I just sort of had some interesting interactions with like Japanese nationalists, I guess you could say, um, which just bad encounters which sort of forced me to push away my Japanese identity completely. I used to just really not want to have anything to do with it. Um, until very recently, probably within the last year, which was, uh, I went over to Japan, I did a sort of small pilgrimage, I guess you could say. It was actually inspired by one of the College of Marine events here that I did last year uh, with uh, Phil Kuzno, his art pilgrimage. Uh, you should check out that book. Um, but um, yeah, I wanted to just get back to my roots and see what it was about. And uh, as soon as I did, I went back to Japan. I was embraced by my family over there. And you know, they wanted to make sure that they ingrained in my head, you are still a Japanese person, you know, as far removed as you are, you are still very much Japanese, and don't you ever forget that. And that was like, I was like, like, wow, okay, you're right, you know, what am I doing? I need to learn the language, I need to pick up on these things, I can't just throw it all away. So, it's sort of interesting. Um, Especially, you're right, as a fourth generation, it's been a strange journey for me, uh, just sort of drifting. <laughs> but um, I hope I answered your question right. Other questions? Yeah. Let's talk to George. Yeah. Uh, I think everyone came to hear not your pre camp experience, but what impact that had on your own maturation and your <coughs> as a teenager? That's probably what. Would you accept it? Were you allowed to go to housing? What was it like to go to school again with other adults, American, who'd been brainwashed to be uh, anti-Japanese? It was a very difficult uh, period. Um, as soon after we left camp, uh, it was a, it, camp was sort of a mm -hmm. place where it became a security blanket in a way. Yeah. And, uh, uh, as, as harsh and as, and as, as, as um, 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 hard it was, um, the, the physical conditions. Um, and so coming back after the war was um, uh, to leave camp um, was um, a very trying, for me, a very trying experience. I didn't know whether I was going to be accepted by the kids in school or not, because I was still a uh, sophomore in school then. And, um, and it, wasn't, it wasn't at all like I thought it was going to be. And yet, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't erase those feelings if they're inside you, you know. There's always there's paranoia. And, and, I, and I don't know if it, if it was just me that felt that way, but I know that when I ran into friends, it's always like, what camp were you in? And, and that was sort of the, the, the common denominator for us. And that, that uh, uh, immediately, you know, 
struck a friendship, a chord of friendship, which uh, we didn't have outside, you know, outside that group. And so that was a difficult transition. And, and you gradually. Siblings? Do you have siblings? I have one sister. Yeah, she's in the audience. She wrote a book too, so yeah. you should read her book. It's uh, called Little Exile. Oh, and, and she's written about yeah, she's written about how how it was to be a, a little girl. Yep. Um, she's a better writer than I am. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for recognizing me. Um, I I am so excited to read your book, and I want to hear the story. And I'm also curious about your writing process. And how was it that being an older person, it's just starting writing, and where did you start, and how did you decide what to put into your book, and um, finally, what's next for you? Yeah. <laughs> Golf. Yeah, right. Uh, it was, it, those are good questions. <laughs> um, starting that late in life to write, um, I never thought I could write. I mean, I didn't, I, and I wasn't a very good reader. I didn't read a lot of books, so, but I didn't read like like an author should read. I wasn't very selective in my writing, in my reading. I just read whatever you know was entertaining. I read a lot of comic books when I was a kid, and and uh, I loved Aesop's Fables when I was about six or seven. And we had a a, a whole volume, a uh, uh, 20 volume collection of what's called Book of Knowledge and, and I looked for all the Aesop's fables in that book and, uh, and then I read a lot of Jack London and I, you know, a lot of books that, um, that I, I just picked up because someone said it was a pretty good book to read. So uh, in high school there was one teacher, I think when we were reading Walden Pond, said that, you know, you should be a writer. I, I didn't take that very seriously because uh, at that time writing was not something that interested interested me. And, but I was surprised with that comment, and it still sticks in my mind. But when I when I began writing, in six, uh, I was 62 years old, uh, and this was in 1992. I was in front of my and thank goodness for computers, because in those longhand, I would never have been able to write what I'd written. But I began typing on the keyboard, and all of a sudden, these stories started to, come, to appear. It was just, um, and it was almost, I was writing, it was almost without a diary, it was just a confession of, of my childhood. And um, just an outpouring of text. And I, you know, and, 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 it, and I write episodically. I could remember certain episodes in my life. And so each episode was like a story onto itself. And um, I remember I went to a workshop uh, way back then with a fellow named Tom Jenks, and, and he uh, he said, you're an, episode, you, you're an episodic writer, you know. Um, and I didn't know what he meant until <laughs> after, you know, thinking about it for a while. <laughs> so um, as these episodes were being written, they were just random episodes. And eventually, uh, I found the thread, you know, for American Yellow. And, and, then I, and then, you know, the plot line, the timeline was something that, that I thought was important. So I used that to tie the stories together. Other questions? I'm just curious what year your parents My mother came, you know, they both came the same year, 1916, but they came on separate ships. My father was, was uh, 16 and my mother was 12. And my father came here to help his brother who had a chicken ranch in Petaluma, California, work on that chicken ranch. And my mother was uh, summoned to America by her parents in Stockton, California, 
where they had this hotel business. So it was in 1916. One last question. Uh, well, I see two hands going up. <laughs> two last questions. These are the last ones. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry, I wasn't here for the first half of the last question. But maybe I missed it. But what was the main inspiration behind your Inspiration behind writing the book. Driving force. Driving force. Behind the book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I missed it.
that's just, you know, just things just happened. It, it wasn't planned. It, it was planned, but it, it, it wasn't planned with with uh, uh, in, anything other in mind than than to provide the best environment that we could for our kids. And, Let's give it up for George. Thank you. As I said at the beginning of uh, the program today, we do have a few free books to pass out. And I will tell you that um, someone other than me selected at random some seats. So if you're sitting in one of those seats, you can be thankful that the numbers they gave me were yours. I need to go, David. In fact, David's really going to do is hand you all four books okay. so you don't have to keep running back okay. here. <laughs> but we will keep him running. If we go back to where the post is on the right and the